Of course, similar to BJT, where things were not really ideal and beautiful, and we had early effect, here we have something called channel length modulation. What does it mean and what, 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 how, is, how is it going to affect our current expression is like this. Basically, uh, we know that as I'm increasing VD, as VD increases, I know that this pinch off point goes from like basically close to drain to some point that is closer to source. And if I increase VD, this point is going to go move to the left more and more, right? What does it mean? It means that, well, this, if I call this, like if the entire thing, let me erase this stuff. Okay, so if the entire thing here is called L, the length of the channel, but then this part that has charges, I'm going to call that the effective L or L effective. I can see that as VD is going up, the L effective is actually decreasing. And I know that this L effective, it, this is the length that I'm integrating over it, right? We talked about this uh, in the previous slide. So what happens really is that when I'm increasing VDS, all that integration is still valid. But one thing that changes is that this L effective changes, meaning that the length that I have in the uh, current expression that I'm talking about is going to be basically L minus some delta L. So it's going to be decreasing by a little bit. So it's going to affect. So basically, because of this, my current is not going to be perfectly constant. So if VDS increases, it's going to affect my current because it actually changes the length. And that's why I call it channel length modulation. It modulates my channel length, right? So because I don't want to actually deal with something in the denominator of this expression and like deal with the delta L, I'm going to model this change. I'm going to say that because if the denominator is actually decreasing, it means that the entire expression is actually increasing, right? The value of the entire ID here, because this denominator is decreasing, this whole thing is going to be increasing. So I'm going to model that increase with some lambda VDS. I'm going to say that uh, my expression is always the same. So my L is going to be the same L. I'm, I'm assuming that my L is actually constant. It's not changing. But then to kind of account for uh, what is happening to L and what is happening to this overall expression, I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to multiply this term by my current expression, 1 plus lambda VDS, right? So basically, it's really telling me that uh, if VDS increases, so if VDS increases, my current will increase. With what proportion? Well, the proportionality is set by this lambda, this constant factor, right? So if basically this lambda is actually, well, if I don't have any channel length modulation, similar to the case of BJT when I didn't have any early effect, then I, I went back to my original equation. So if I don't have any channel length modulation, this lambda is going to be zero, right? So zero if no channel length modulation. So it's going to be 1 plus 0, so I'm just going to go back to my original expression. However, uh, if I have any lambda, and this lambda, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, that like in a moment, that what it is dependent on. If I have any finite value for the lambda, then it means that my VDS is going to affect my current. And as you can see, the effect is going to be something like this. So instead of having a perfect horizontal line, instead of having a current that is independent of VDS, it my current is going to be dependent on the VDS, but then the dependence you can see that like is basically very, very small is it is with a very small slope. So you can imagine that the dependence is not that big of a deal, right? And you can imagine that this is going to be a bigger and bigger problem if the L was actually small in the first place, right? Like imagine that L was, I don't know, uh, if it was a hundred nanometer, and the channel length modulation, the amount of L that I actually, uh, basically the L effective because of VDS, if, if it became, um, I don't know, 90 nanometer, so I had 10 nanometer change in the L, this would be basically a 10% kind of a change. But if in the newer technologies, for example, if the L was actually 20 nanometer, and if I had 10 nanometer change in the L, then 
well, my L effective becomes 10 nanometer. Now I have a 50% change. Now, this means that the channel length modulation was something that people thought about it as a, like a second order effect. It's not that important and everything, but that was only true when we were talking about older technologies where, where we had really long lengths, right? With the newer technologies where we have smaller and smaller lengths, right now people are actually fabricating transistors in seven nanometer technology. So you can imagine that this channel length modulation is going to be really, really uh, important. It's going to affect my transistor's behavior by a lot, right? For this course, we're not going to be basically uh, concerning ourselves with that kind of discussion. That's basically left for an advanced course in electronic circuit design, in analog electronic circuit design. But I just wanted to let you know that this channel length modulation is actually becoming more and more of uh, more more and more of an important problem in modern uh, MOS technologies. Okay. Now, one difference that we have here uh, compared to the BJT transistors is that, unlike the early effect in bipolar, the amount of channel length modulation is under the circuit's designer's control. This is something that I just mentioned that. Basically, this channel length modulation, this lambda factor, is proportional to 1 over L, meaning that the larger the L, the less important this is, right? And I just explained with some number numerical examples why this is actually valid, right? So if you want to have less and less channel length modulation, you better have longer and longer channels for your transistor. Your technology, if, it, if you're using, for example, a 90 nanometer technology, uh, that only sets the minimum length. It doesn't stop you from having a uh, having a transistor that has a length of like I don't know two micrometers or three micrometers or even longer than that, right? Of course, you don't want to just randomly increase the size the length of the transistor because it's going to have a lot of consequences as we will see. But at the end of the day, you could have longer transistor if you want to use, especially if you want to use your transistor as a let's say a current source, right? If you want to make a current source and all you care about is the is how flat this line is you better go with a very very long length another effect that happens in mosfets is body effect so this is less important than channel length modulation and we're not going to be dealing with it in this course um, this slide is just for your information only just in case you have heard body effect you would know what it is right so it's going to be a quick uh, kind of a talk so the idea is that uh, well, the source of a transistor, there's absolutely no reason for the source to be connected to ground, right? So a lot of times, and you will see the circuits in, in this course and in, in many other places, that the source is connected to some other node in the circuit. So it could be um, another transistor or a resistor or something like that, right? So up to now, all of our discussions, in all of our discussions, source was actually connected to ground. But, well, you can imagine that it doesn't have to, right? So now, if I have a voltage at the source, uh, I'm going to basically connect the voltage source here so that you, you would know that there's, this voltage is not going to be zero, right? If I have some voltage at the source, uh, well, the good news is that um, the diode between this P-type substrate and the N-type source is still going to be uh, reverse biased. So I'm not really worried about that because, well, we said that P-substrate is always connected to ground or the lowest potential in our circuit. And well, the source is positive, so this diode is going to be definitely reverse biased. So I'm not going to be worried about that. However, this source, uh, basically the difference of the voltage between the source and the substrate causes some changes in the, all of the discussions that we have talked about up to now, right? Because we always assume that the substrate and the source are both ground. So like the VGS was pretty much uh, the, volt, the difference between gate and source voltage was the difference between gate and substrate. Now we have to actually differentiate between them. It turns out if your VSB, um, I'm gonna call substrate uh, basically the body of my transistor. So I'm gonna call this body and then I'm gonna define something called VSB, which is equal to the voltage difference between source and the body, okay? So basically, it turns out that, well, if source is actually zero, there is no voltage difference. So this VSB becomes zero, right? But if the voltage difference, if source is not zero, I'm gonna have some VSB. 
And it turns out that VSP, the effect of having that VSP is that my threshold voltage is going to be increased a little bit. And my threshold voltage of my transistor is actually different from the threshold voltage that I always well, use, right? So uh, the, the equation that basically governs this behavior is well, written here, where well, you don't really need to know what is this phi f or like VS, well, VSP, you know what is uh, what it is, but then phi f or gamma that you have here, these are basically, um, as mentioned here, these are technology dependent parameters. So you will learn about them in, again, more advanced courses in analog circuit design. But then what this expression really tells us is that the threshold voltage is going to be some constant threshold voltage plus a function of that VSP. And you can, you can see that if VSP becomes zero, then, well, this term will go away. This becomes equal to that, so their subtraction is going to be zero. So this entire term will become zero, so you just basically get the same VTH zero, right? But then if VSP is actually anything but zero, anything, any finite, if it has any finite value, it means that the threshold voltage is going to be a little bit uh, larger or a little bit greater than VTH zero. So if your VTH zero is like, let's say, 0.5, your V threshold might actually change to, I don't know, 0.55 or 0.6 or whatever, depending on what is the VSP, okay? So this is called the body effect. And by the way, because of this, MOSFETs, this is one of the major differences between MOSFETs and BJTs. MOSFETs are actually known as a four-terminal transistor, not or a four-terminal component or device, not a three-terminal one. With BJT, you only have three terminals. With MOSFET, you can see that I have a fourth terminal, which I've shown with this dashed line, which is really uh, trying to uh, basically hint that we have a body terminal here that is connected to, uh, we connected the body to ground, and then we have this uh, basically source terminal um, independent of that. So I have a gate, I have a drain, I have a source, and now I realize that I have a body, okay? So if I have, if I don't wanna change the body of my transistor, and I want to keep it at zero, nothing has to be done. But there are ways in the modern CMOS technologies, modern MOSFET fabrication technologies, where you could actually even change the body of your transistor and connect it to some voltage that is not zero. Uh, of course, you don't want to do that in 99% of the time, but then there, is, there are certain cases that you want to play with this body voltage to get some advantage. Uh, from, well, basically in terms of, I don't know, the, the AC or DC performance of your transistor.